Yeah, finding the public policy in politics, something uh, Colin Moore has studied all his life. <laughs> He's a political scientist leader at uh, the University uh, of Hawaii in Manoa, and he joins us today to uh, talk about public policy in politics. Thank you so much for joining us, Colin. Great to be here, Jay. So, uh, yeah, you know, here we are. Um, I don't know what you would say. It's, it's, it's not the... Um, it's it's not the eighth inning. Um, maybe it's the seventh inning. <laughs> because yeah, sixth or innings. seventh. That sounds yeah. about right. And uh, we, you know, we have various people who've shown up uh, to pull papers. Uh, let's talk about the state first. Let's talk about governor first. Um, and I I find some of them very interesting and some of them really dark horses. Uh, who who are the who are the light horses, if you will? <laughs> Well, I mean, you 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 certainly have uh, the leader uh, is is Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. He has been his poll numbers are extremely high. I mean, he's leading his potential opponents by, uh, you know, in the double digits, you know, 30 points in some cases or more. Um, so he's clearly the favorite going into this race. I mean, it's 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 been a while, I think, since we've had a Democratic primary for the governor. Um, where where it was open, where we don't have an incumbent, where you've had such a uh, a, a strong lead from one of the candidates, but that doesn't mean he's going to win. Um, so there's two other candidates right now who've pulled papers for the Democratic primary, two main candidates, Vicky Cayetano, of course, and Kurt Caldwell. Um, if there's going to be a dark horse, my suspicion it it could be Vicky Cayetano or someone else. I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, but Vicky Cayetano does have bring a lot of strength to the table. She um, is independent. She's not connected to politics directly herself, although, of course, she was first lady. So I think there's kind of an open question about how much Governor Cayetano, her husband, his legacy is going to affect this race. But she's clearly campaigned as an independent businesswoman. Uh, she, as some folks um, might recall, was uh, partially ran Mayor Rick Blangiardi's campaign. And so she's kind of coming at it from uh, a similar angle. I think some of the corruption scandals, I think people's frustration with the mainstream Democratic Party, those really play into her favor. The third candidate, Kirk Caldwell, normally you'd think of as someone who's would be a really strong candidate. Kirk Caldwell has always been a fu strong fundraiser. He's raised a bunch of money for this race. He still is. But his polling has been really bad. In fact, most of the polls have him not even breaking double digits. Um, I think that partially is a legacy of some of the issues that occurred when he was mayor. I think he's so connected with the you know, very troubled rail project uh, that voters still tie him to that. Um, I think some of the scandals in his administration um, are pulling him down. So I think it's going to be very difficult for Kirk Caldwell to be competitive in this race. Now, saying that he's come from behind before and succeeded, but I think he's probably unlikely um, to come from behind. Now, the last candidate is someone, you know, I want to make very clear, has not declared their candidacy right now. Um, but if you follow any rumors in Hawaii politics, uh, people seem to be operating as if he already has declared he's going to run for governor. And that is Congressman Kai Kahele. Um, he was very outspoken on the Red Hill disaster. I think he um, got himself a lot of goodwill. Um, so he's likely the dark horse. Um, is he going to be successful, though? I mean, what chance does he have? And he has, I think, two, uh, you know, two central challenges. The first, of course, is he hasn't campaigned. I mean, he hasn't declared yet, and he probably won't declare until May um, if he does decide to run. And that doesn't give him very much time. I mean, you have May to August to run a gubernatorial campaign to get that up and running. That's going to be a real challenge. The second challenge is he doesn't have that much money. Um, he can't move money from his congressional up campaign fund into a state fund. You can do it, although it's very complicated. It involves asking your don returning money to your donors and asking them to send it back to you. That's complicated. So he's going to come start with a real um, financing disadvantage, and he's going to have a tough time overcoming that, especially when you're talking about folks like Josh Green, who've raised, uh, you know, who now have well over a million dollars and and um, and will continue to raise money. Um, you know, the second thing is 
that Green is very popular with a lot of demographics that Kai Kahele likely would be competitive in. He's another neighbor island senator. Remember, both Kahele and Green were state senators from the Big Island. He's Green is very popular with with uh, with Hawaiians with Democrat with demographics across the board. And so Kahele will have to convince some of those voters who already say they're voting for Green to come over to his camp. And, and that's something that's going to be tough. It's especially going to be tough uh, without much time. Mm, wow. <clears throat> so, um, you know, let's look at Lieutenant Governor just so we can throw it all in the mix here. I, I never understand the real relationship of Governor and Lieutenant Governor. I mean, in terms of the election itself. Um, but um, there are, there were, I, I see three, four, five. Can you talk about them? Sure. So um, we got, it's a crowded race. Uh, Lieutenant governor's race is always a hard one to predict because really it tends to turn more on name recognition than policy. Um, who Who's likely to come out ahead? Um, you know, well, right now I'd say that uh, there is one candidate who's been doing very well recently, and that's Sylvia Luke, the chair of the House Finance Committee. She's managed to get most of the big union endorsements, which are not decisive, but they matter here in Hawaii, particularly if you're someone like Sylvia Luke, who's a real insider, someone who, of course, is a very powerful figure, but doesn't have a lot of name recognition. Getting those endorsements, uh, hooking up your campaign to the unions that have strong messaging operations, that can get people out to sign wave, that's that's gonna be key for her. That said, I don't think she has this wrapped up by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Jill Takuda was the last one who ran. She came within three percentage points of beating Josh Green. Um, she's run an island-wide race before. She has support from some fairly significant players, although she hasn't managed to turn that into a lot of endorsements. Um, Keith Amamiya was the person who last ran a, uh, a major race, a major island-wide race, of course. He lost to Rick Blangiardi. Um, and uh, Akaike Anderson is the only Hawaiian in this race. He was a popular city councilman from the Windward side. Um, and then Sherry Manor McNamara, I think, is trying to run like Rick Blangiardi did, like Vicky Cayetano is doing um, as an independent. Uh, she's running as a Democrat, but someone who's not really deeply into democratic politics here. Um, I think she's counting on a lot of small business support. So mm -hmm. at this point, I'd say it's pretty much anyone's game. Um, and it's going to come down, I think, to their ability to raise the money to get their name out there. Um, and some of that may come down to you know their support from some of the decisive unions um, that'll help them do that. You know, it's like two separate races. They're really not connected. And yet, um, maybe they are. Are they connected? If if I'm um, a front runner for governor and I say, look, I, I like one of these lieutenant governor candidates, uh, we're kind of a ticket, you know, is there any benefit in doing that or is that more of a detriment? You know, I think it, I think it could be a benefit if there was a leading LG candidate who, for example, Green or Cayetano thought really delivered a demographic to them that they didn't have. I think it's unlikely you're going to see that in this race because it's such a crowded LG primary. Um, you know, most of the governors probably, there, there's not an incentive for them uh, to try to um, present themselves as, um, as uh, uh, running mates. Um, so I don't think you're gonna see that this time. I mean, you're right, it is a, it's an unusual situation. It's, it's a little strange how we do this. We're not unique, of course, in the country in doing this way, but um, it's, it's hard that the governor doesn't get to pick his or her running mate. And then of course, after the primary, uh, they're, uh, they're mashed together and, and they're running together, even if they don't like each other. And we certainly have seen lots of examples in the past of governors and lieutenant governors who absolutely couldn't stand each other. They could barely even conceal it in public. Yeah, that's a, that's a detriment because if they run separately and win separately and, and they don't get along, they're not gonna be much of a team. Although you know, it seems clear to me that the people who want to run for lieutenant governor would like to be governor, um, and if you get to be one, then you then you're a natural for the other. No, that's really the only reason to run for lieutenant governor. <laughs> I mean, one thing I will say about our LG position here is that there are almost no direct responsibilities. In fact, one of the only things the lieutenant governor is actually responsible for are name changes. If you want to change your name, the LG's office has to sign up for it. So what it means is that if you're LG, it can be a pretty good 
platform to run for governor because you have a lot of press coverage, um, you, but you have very little responsibility. You can pretty much blame anything that goes wrong on the governor, and you can take credit for things that, that go well. And, you know, Josh Green, in some ways, has been a master of that. Mm, yeah. So what, what's the economics these days on running for governor or lieutenant governor? How much money do you have to raise? How much money do you have to spend in order to make it? Um, I, you know, at the end of the day, like in other places in the country, maybe most places, it's a question of money, isn't it? It's, it's always partially a question of money. I mean, what does money get you? Money gets your name out there. Money buys name recognition primarily. Um, it keeps your picture, your campaign um, in front of voters' eyes. And here in Hawaii, we don't have particularly ideologically driven campaigns. You know, the culture wars don't really make it across the Pacific. And so a lot of it is candidates trying to well, get their name out there, but also connect with voters. I mean, it's always very folksy. I'm, I'm one of you. I mean, our campaigns are pretty light on policy for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, but you need money to do that. So I'd say, but it's not decisive. I'd say you need you need a million dollars to be competitive. Um, over more than that is, is good, but you know, you can look at the classic example here of Abercrombie and Ige, where Abercrombie had dramatically more money than Ige did. I can't remember now, uh, how much more, but it was at least five times more, maybe, maybe even more than that. And of course, um, he got beat pretty badly by David Ige. So there's a baseline I think you need to hit. Um, uh, after that, um, I, I think it. You know, you know, there are kind of uh, decreasing returns to raising more and more money. But I'd say a million bucks. You got to have a million. lieutenant governor. What what what's the price tag on that one? At least half a million. But but more is better. I mean, the thing about a crowded race like the LG's race that pretty much is devoid of policy discussions and doesn't get the kind of media coverage the governor's race does is that money buys even more. And when what's been interesting in some of these LG races, well, the last one at least, are independent um, expenditures. In other words, PACs that are spending for the candidates. I don't think there's anybody uh, who uh, wouldn't argue that Be Change Now, the Carpenters PAC, uh, was very um, crucially important to Josh Green's win in that race because they spent a ton of money independently on Green um, they helped boost his image as the, you know, the, the doctor trying to take care of folks. And they just kept his his name in front of everyone that time. And it was a close race, but I think that that money ended up being decisive there. So endorsements are important um, and uh, making making people feel that you're one of them. That's important in Hawaii. Um, but, uh, you know, the title of our show is uh, Finding the Public Policy in Politics. Um, referring, you know, specifically to Hawaii, and and um, you know, I wonder uh, what what public issues, uh, what public policy issues, should be not not to say they are, but should be in play this year. And if I was a smart candidate appealing to people who care about public policy, what would I be focusing on? You know, one thing I'd say is uh, one policy would be tourism. There is a lot of frustration here about how we've managed our number one industry. And I think having a plan to manage the tourism industry better, uh, whether that's um, you know, passing things like green fees, which the ledge has talked about this year, changing HTA, um, convincing people that this industry is not something we necessarily want to get rid of, but it's something we have to manage better. Um, the second thing, obviously, is affordable housing. Um, you know, that is always comes up as the number one issue for voters. Uh, I think maybe a realistic plan to deal with that would be helpful. Something, um, you know, either reducing regulations to build, uh, um, embracing something like Senator Stanley Chang's Aloha Homes idea, mm, building yeah. properties on state land. I think that should be at the center of any discussion for sure. I mean, those two that would be kind of folded into general cost of living issues, I think would be are, are the top of my, on the top of most voters' minds. Um, you know, we've had we've had some mm, corruption issues lately, um, and I suppose if you walk down the street, any street, uh, and ask people if they had confidence in Hawaii state government, uh, you probably would not get a robust yes. Uh, <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> Is that an issue? Should be? Should that be an issue? I mean, we seem to be missing out on that. Everybody says, well. 
Um, I'll go on name recognition uh, if I know him or his his family. Uh, you know, that'll be good. Um, but you know, I, I'm not sure that anybody is standing up or or if it would help to stand up and say, I am going to make you know government more transparent, more reliable, um, more honest. I think I think that that's another discussion. I hope the governor's uh, gubernatorial candidates talk about that. I do think that's a real frustration with voters. We know that the polls we've done, voters show that they have you know relatively little confidence in our state legislature. Um, you know, there's a, understandable fears about the levels of corruption, and now we have evidence that shows some pretty shocking corruption cases. I think that would be something voters are interested in. I don't think that's the necessarily the sort of emotional issue um, that's really going to turn people out. I don't know if you're going to see a lot of disagreement among the candidates on that issue. I think cleaning up government is something everyone always says. I, I think the only way to actually make progress on this issue is to elect more new people. In other words, to have way more challenges in the primaries and the general elections. That's what's going to make a difference in this case. Not I mean, you can only pass so many transparency rules and restrictions on campaign donations and whether or not, you know, a legislator can attend a golf tournament. We already have all that stuff. It's not that we don't have these laws on the books. Um, you know, pe people know it's, it's illegal to take cash bribes to affect legislation. So it's not like we don't have the laws. It's that there's something about the culture. And I think part of that means that uh, some legislators, a lot of legislators, have just got way too comfortable in those seats. Um, you know, we have too many incumbents not being challenged. And that's a healthy thing for democracy. Um, and it's particularly tough here in Hawaii because we don't get the natural two party system. The Republican Party here uh, just isn't large enough to really mount a challenge in, in nearly every district in this state, with a few important exceptions. Um, and the party doesn't really encourage primary challenges for obvious reasons. So this has to be more of a grassroots effort. And, you know, there are ways to do that from, uh, you know, there are some organizations that try to recruit young candidates. Another way would be to, you know, make it a little bit easier to get public financing to run. That would certainly help. Um, that, that, I think, is what's really going to move the needle. How about term limits? Right. Term limits. That, I, I, I'm always a little cautious about term limits. I think that there's a danger there, especially if you set them too too short. Um, you know, the, 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 and, and why do I say that? Because what happens if, say, let's say you have a limit of four terms for a member of the House, that means they serve eight years. What you have then are legislators who don't have much experience. So then who do they rely on? They really end up relying on lobbyists uh, because they tend to be the masters of the ins and outs of the legislature of policy. And I think you've seen that in states where they have instituted term limits. Maybe there's a place for term limits um, and you set them long. You say eight terms is as long as you can serve, something like that. I could see potentially a, a role for that there, but I really don't think that's the solution to the problem. I think what we need is more supply. Uh, we don't need to you know, put arbitrary limits on how long people can serve, but we need them to defend their seat every single time and that means making it easier for people to run against the incumbents yeah i'm, I'm reminded of an organization called runforsomething.net on the mainland uh, amanda Littman is the name of the founder and uh it doesn't matter what you run for run for something anything uh i think she's mostly democratic in her orientation by the way <laughs> that's so, great i mean <laughs> we need more candidates <laughs> What about what about the uh, Democratic Party? I, I'm not talking about the Republican Party because in this context we don't have time for that. But in the Republican in the Democratic Party, um, we have platforms, we have officers, we have leaders ostensibly. Uh, we have you know the grassroots people um, who can talk to each other and formulate policy. May I say, are they doing their job here with the Democratic Party? And is is the platform they are coming up with being respected by the people who are elected. Well, I think people who are working for the party do a tremendous amount of work on policy and designing those platforms. But I think you just got at the issue there, which is that it doesn't really matter to the people who are elected. I mean, uh, are they, do they often break from the, the party platform? Absolutely. Um, are they really that scared of the Democratic Party disciplining them somehow? 
not that I've seen. I mean, look, Tulsi Gabbard, who certainly did not toe the line of the Democratic Party here or nationally, uh, was one of our two members of Congress. And uh, she, I mean, she wasn't really punished. I know that there was an effort and a lot of frustration among Democrats uh, with Congressman Ed Case and some of his reluctance to support Joe Biden's package. Um, I don't really, I've never got a feeling that Representative Case is all that threatened by, uh, you know, party insiders or activists, I should say, more than insiders, activists uh, going after him. So uh, the, the party itself doesn't really have much ability to discipline elected officials. Um, so I think it's great uh, that these platforms are created and they're created in a thoughtful way. I do think it means that uh, they can nurture ideas that then eventually bubble up and do get passed. But, um, you know, we don't have a strong party system in this state or this country. Parties are generally kind of big tents and they're a little bit weak. Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, I want to talk about leadership. You know, um, it, it was clear enough uh, in the press and, and to any observer that there was tension, there has been tension between David Ige as governor and Josh Green as the lieutenant governor. I mean, that was visible. Um, and, and, you know, it's it's troublesome in the sense they were not always together on things. They were kind of competing in, on COVID. And, and and Josh Green was running for governor throughout his lieutenant governor uh, <laughs> period of time. But, you know, a lot of people say that David Ige was not really acting in a leadership uh, capacity. Um, that the legislature would have been better off had he been more assertive about political positions uh, and about public policy. Um, and, you know, the, the, the state whip, so to speak, uh, keeping everyone in line and making sure they follow and making sure nothing embarrassing or untoward happens. Um, and I, I wonder your thoughts about whether that seems to be baked into our, you know, political DNA uh, or whether it was just him, whether it can or will be corrected. And, at the optimum, how, how should it work? Between the governor and the legislature? Yeah. Well, we actually, I think we have two great comparisons with David Ige and Neil Abercrombie that you couldn't imagine two leaders with more different styles. So um, I think that, look, Governor Ige is a strong communicator. He would say the same thing himself. Interestingly enough, he was elected in part because the thought was he had a great, you know, he would have a great relationship with the legislature. He was chair of Senate Ways and Means. He could, he could do that, you know, whip, whip the votes and get things through. Um, but something magical seems to happen when you enter Washington Place, and all of a sudden your former colleagues decide they don't like you so much anymore. I don't know if that's just, uh, you know, a dynamic between David Ige and the legislative leadership, or if that tends to be true of most governors in the legislature, but I think the latter is more likely that uh, there just is this adversarial relationship. Uh, but you're right, David Ige wasn't good at getting any of his packages through the legislature. Um, could have maybe have been helpful for him to play hardball politics more. I'm, I'm inclined to believe that's probably true. I don't think uh, he got a lot of respect from the legislature. But that was in part because he, in some ways, refused to use the one thing that the governor has, his most powerful tool, which, as Teddy Roosevelt used to say, was the bully pulpit. You can, motive, you can mold public opinion as the governor because you're the only one. You get to spend the most time on television. People say, listen to what you say. He never really attacked the legislature. He never um, really used those tools to shape public opinion to support his positions. And I think that to my mind, was uh, a real shame. I don't think that David Ige really appreciated how he could use uh, speeches and communication to push his agenda through. At the same time, I would say that, of course, Governor Abercrombie uh, is usually thought of as, a, as an excellent speaker, um, certainly a strong speaker, someone not afraid to express his opinions. Sometimes um, too much all, so. Yeah, sometimes too much. Uh, he's gotten that criticism many, many times. I mean, that didn't help him either. Um, so, um, but I do think that a certain amount of criticism of Ige is warranted. I mean, I, and I think that it wasn't for lack of ideas. David Ige's administration actually had a lot of good ideas. But if you listen to his state of the state addresses and all of these policies he'd articulate and what actually got accomplished, it's it's a pretty modest list. We're talking about things like air conditioning classrooms. To be governor for eight years and not have much more than that to show for it isn't isn't great. And at the end of COVID, he even saw 
you know, a certain amount of uh, competition from House Speaker si Scott Psyche in just communicating the state's position to the public. So that that I think is a shame. I mean, I think Governor Ige is someone who cares deeply about Hawaii, but I think he missed the opportunity uh, to try to convince people to support his package, which would have given him some leverage in the legislature. You know, we live in a state, I think, where the biggest worry of anybody running or, or in, in office is uh, to be criticized. Uh, no surprise, I think that exists many places. Um, but I, and I wonder, you know, what your thoughts are as to the right way for a, a candidate um, or an official to handle that. You can expect to be criticized. You can expect the, the press will find something, somebody will find something uh, to criticize you about, and, and you can handle it right or you can handle it not so right. Uh, you can lose an election over it easily, uh, even if you are otherwise qualified, um, and you can be mm, you know, made impotent somehow if you don't handle it right while you're in office. Uh, what's your thought about the right way to handle it? It's a great question. I think that's part of the art of politics. In some cases, the right answer is to say, we messed up, I get it. I understand why people are angry, to take it on the chin. In some cases, and I don't think Governor Ige did this enough, you have to ask members of your staff to take the fall, to resign. Um, you know, it's not always fair, um, but if you're the person leading the agency, um, you know, the public needs to see that action, that they're being replaced or there is discipline. You can't be too loyal to your own people. And I think that anyone appointed to one of those positions should understand that they might be asked to resign on, on any day. You know, and the last is to, to push back if you think, you know, if you think you can persuade people, if you think it's unfair. Um, and trying to find that balance of, you know, do we, do we acknowledge it? Do we fight it? Um, is what separates a, a great politician from a failed politician. Yeah, we need we need great leaders. We do, especially with all the, the challenges that face the state. That is challenges in, in public policy that we have not addressed and we better bloody well address them soon. Um, we don't have time to go into all of the ones right now, maybe in another discussion. But I do want to spend at least a few minutes with you on the federal side on the delegation. Um, who's running for what and uh, who are the front runners and what challenges are they facing? So there's really only going to be likely one competitive uh, congressional election um, here, which is uh, going to be um, Kaikahele's seat if he decides to leave to run for governor. And there's already some people jockeying for that to run for that seat potentially. Again, that would require him to announce to run for governor, because I don't think anyone thinks they can beat him if he runs again. Um, the two names I've heard are um, Senator Jarrett Keohokalole of the Windward side, also of the Windward side, newly elected uh, rep Patrick Bronco. I know that there are some other folks who have been considering it. I think that um, you know those are probably uh, the likely picks. Um, I've even heard some people say they, they, they think Tulsi Gabbard might come back and run, although I think that's, that's pretty oh, unlikely. That's a real, real long shot. Yeah. That's an extreme long shot. I agree. <laughs> um, and I think the party wants to consolidate around a candidate relatively early, and I think it's likely to be one of the, the two uh, 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 gentlemen I just mentioned uh, earlier. Let me ask you one thing about the delegation, although, uh, you know, Maisie Hirono gets into the mix of it and God bless her for that. She does, she's courageous, fearless, she does, uh, fearless. It's really wonderful to see uh, at least Maisie do that. But in general, you know, our delegation doesn't seem to be involved in the crises that are going on in Washington, the crises in the, in the Congress, the crises in, um, you know, in foreign policy. We're, we're in an inflection point, I'm sure you'll agree in terms of the liberal world order in this world. Um, the, and people in Hawaii don't really think much about it, I think. And it's not, a, it's not a, a, a public policy issue that they care about. And so what we get from Washington, from the delegation, are um, smaller issues, real, little tiny issues, um, but no statement of leadership on the, the issues that affect the nation and the world. What are your thoughts about that? I think that they're following a, a model that's been, with the exception of Patsy Mink, that's been followed by our congressional delegation for a long time. I mean, you know, Dan Inoue, although, you know, despite the fact that he was, became one of the most senior members of the Senate, wasn't someone who really was out front on, on a lot of issues for the most part. 
Um, you know, he kept a pretty low profile for his seniority. Um, and I think that in some ways, Brian Schatz has kind of followed that model, that there's a sense that the voters here want, um, want them to focus on local issues that affect Hawaii, bring federal dollars back to Hawaii and stay off television for the most part. Um, you know, Maisie Hirona, you just mentioned, she's the most outspoken, um, but she also um, you know, has been criticized for that. Um, you know, certainly Tulsi Gabbard was, although she's a, she's in a different category herself. So I don't know if it's, it's something that people decide or it's a sense they get from voters, but, um, I don't think our congressional delegation goes to Washington trying to, to lead the country. I think they go there trying to look out for Hawaii. And for the most part, I think that's what the voters want. Yeah. That's what the voters want. It's not, it's not what I want, uh, but it's, it's, it's what the voters want. Uh, one, one, and one thing springs out of that, and I want to ask you about, you know, the body politic, the, the, the body of citizen, the citizenry, so to speak. Um, you know, we've always talked about low turnout. We've talked about complacency, really monumental complacency. Uh, where are we on that? Has COVID, has the, uh, you know, the experience in Washington, the insurrection, uh, Ukraine, um, Afghanistan, for that matter. Have these issues raised the level of awareness? Have they raised the level of interest by the the Hawaii the Hawaii voting, uh, you know, con constituency? I don't think so. I mean, I think we will see the sort. I mean, we did see a pretty robust increase in turnout during the last election cycle, during the presidential election. I hope I hope that'll continue. Although I suspect it'll go down a fair bit. Um, Look, I think for as many people who are motivated by hate or anger or frustration, uh, there are just as many people who drop out, you know, who take the attitude of pox on both their houses. I don't want to be involved in this dirty business. Um, so I don't think you're going to see a huge outpouring of, you know, increase in, in voter participation. I wish I could say, give you a different answer, um, but I don't think we're going to see that. Well, if I give you a jurisdiction, a state, for example, where people are, um, you know, complacent and the voting turnout and awareness is low. What are the risks to the state, to the jurisdiction, um, to the the way in which the state is is governed by the government? Uh, what could go wrong that would not go wrong if they were more uh, involved? Well, I think we've just seen some examples of that here, where you get elected officials who are extremely comfortable, who are comfortable even engaging in corruption because there's not that many people watching them um, and there's not that many people challenging them. Um, and so you don't get the kind of robust uh, democracy that you need. You don't get the challenges. You don't get the fights that um, lead to transparency, that, that demonstrate that these are issues that people Need to, need to have addressed. Um, so I think we're, we're living through that. Would you agree with me that um, if you don't attend to public policy, then government is not protecting you, providing you a, a political and social and economic environment uh, that, will, that will carry you through, sustain you even in times of uh, difficulty? Absolutely. And I think we need to work harder on this problem. I mean, the fact that we have largely uh, dropped civics, robust civics requirements from our school system, I think um, um, is partially to blame, although I, there's been a lot of efforts here in Hawaii to turn that around at the DOE, and I've been part of those. Um, but, but you're right, you are. And I think the other, the other message I try to express to people is that it's, it's not as hard as you think it is. You just need to invest a little bit of time. Um, go to a few meetings, find an issue you care about. And once you get comfortable with the language, with how it works, you're going to stay involved. It's really just getting people involved that first moment. Um, you know, and often this comes from just being really angry about something very local and specific. Um, but once you've learned those skills, you stay involved. And that's why we need to get young people to learn those skills early on. Absolutely. It's, it's the nomenclature, the icons, the, the things you can own and that make you, you know, uh, connect you. Um, one last question before we go, Colin. Um, what's what's the calendar from here on out? Uh, what's the day uh, by which you have to file papers? What's the primary day and what's uh, election day? And what should voters be thinking about? Boy, all right. So um, our primary is uh, August 13th. That's going to be the, the key day here in Hawaii because so many of our 
um, elections are decided on that day. Um, you're going to receive your ballot by July 26th. Uh, the general election then is on November 8th. So those are the real days to, to keep in mind. Um, remember, we're still voting, um, it's all mail voting again, although of course there'll be places you can drop those off the same day, um, but you could, should expect to, to receive your ballot um, on July 26th and have that in by August 13th. That is the, the primary election day. That's the day to remember. And you're gonna see um, these campaigns really roar into focus. There hasn't been all that much time on television, but that's going to change really, I'd say, beginning late May and early June, you're going to see be flooded with ads uh, for our uh, August primary. And that includes those dates apply to the neighbor islands as well. And uh, maybe uh, we can have a show later on when, when, when things are revealed in terms of the candidates for the neighbor islands too. Sounds great, Jay. The other thing is uh, pulling papers. Uh, all those people run for something. I mean, it's in June, isn't it? If you want to pull papers, uh, you have to go by uh, early June. That's right. It's June seventh, so okay. uh, that's the that's the final deadline. Um, sometimes candidates are a little slow to pull papers, even people who have unofficially announced to the media. But that's that's the final deadline. So, um, which is late. Um, you know that that gives you a lot of a lot of time to change your mind or think about it. But yeah, if you're thinking about running. June seventh. That's the that's the date you need to file. Just happens to be two months from today. <laughs> ah, I didn't even think about that. You're right. Two months. You have two months to make up your mind. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Colin Moore of UH Manoa Political Science. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jay. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.